All right, let's get started, though, because we do have limited time because these are very busy ladies, and you have a whole weekend to continue with as well. So I'm going to start with Julia down there. We're going to go back to, could you tell us about the origins of this film? And you, know, you can go all the way back to when you first started talking to author Kate Camillo. Uh, yeah, I always say it's every movie has a birth story. So our birth story um, it started a long time ago in 2008. Um, I read the book. The book was shared with me. I was an independent producer. Um, shared with me, and I thought it would make a great live action movie. So I set it up at Fox uh, 2000 with Elizabeth Gabler, and we developed it there with Martin Hines, who, who did the adaptation. They did not make it, as is often the case in development. It went into turnaround. And um, a number of years later, I met with Melissa Cobb at Netflix, and she said, what's the what's the one that got away? And I said, it's The Magician's Elephant. And she remembered reading the book to her daughter, um, and she essentially bought it in the room. I mean, she read the script, she was um, incredibly excited, and she was like, you need to meet this amazing director, Wendy Rogers, and uh, I did, and then we made this movie, and we decided to make it uh, animated, because it really lended itself to an animated kind of style, so that is how it was born. It's lovely, and it definitely, you know, I know you did talk about it, it could be live action, could be animated. I, I don't think it could be more beautifully made unless it were animated, so I'm glad that you ended up here with this wonderful story. Well, yeah, and I, I, I also think sometimes things happen for a reason, and I think in 2008, Fox, Fox did say, if you thought about it, animated, and I was less enthusiastic because at the time, Animation was more cookie cutter. You know, people were sort of like, you have to do it a certain way, you know, you know, but now I think there's a really incredible renaissance in animation where it really is, uh, right? I mean, it can be truly creator driven and you can truly have a bespoke animated experience that supports the material. So I'm really happy that we said, no, keep it in the drawer. We'll wait until we get the right partner and Netflix was the right partner. Uh, Melissa really, saw the vision, saw what it could be, and saw that it was going to be an amazing film under Wendy. Absolutely. And, and we're going to loop back to visuals in a sec, but I want to stick with the, the idea of taking a book that's such a beloved author's work to the big screen. And, and Wendy, maybe you could talk to us about some of the challenges that came from translating the novel to a feature-length feature film. So... Um Obviously, a lot of there had already been um, the adaptation and a number of drafts before Netflix picked it up and before I joined the project. So there had been, you know, Martin and Julia had really sort of cracked how to bring what is a beautiful lyrical poem of a book that's, you know, so um, heartwarming and touching. But they'd really cracked the code of how to make that into an, a three-act structure with, you know, real stakes and so, a story and a journey that would really show the grit and determination of this this boy that needed to find his sister. Um, you know, every, every movie has... Um, in animation, you know, it's a very iterative process and we spend a number of years working on story beyond script. So every movie goes through an evolution with that as well. And ours was no different. We obviously, we had moments where we were like, oh, we're 15 minutes too long. Um, <laughs> what are we gonna cut? And, <laughs> and when you have to make some, you know, big sacrifices of things that you need to, to to cut from a film that can sort of then change tone and you have to sort of like craft around but you know you always keep the sort of north stars of what is the story about how do we care for the you know what makes us care for this boy and want to follow his journey it's an ensemble film which is quite difficult because you have to weave in a lot of different characters around this central braid of peter and his journey and his his hope and belief and the reinvigoration of the town, you have to kind of show all of that and you know join all those braids together at the end, hopefully. Um, it was an amazing opportunity, an amazing challenge. It's, it's wonderful. I, I just gonna make one, uh, one brag though, I wanna say, that Kate DiCamillo loves this movie. And that's not always the case, right? And she, so anyway, I just wanna say, yay. And I wanna, <laughs> I wanna 
double brag on that. Um, <laughs> when we spoke with Kate at the end of the film, and we didn't have a lot of contact with her during the production, but one of the things that she mentioned was that her favorite moment in the film was when um, uh, Le uh, Leo and Gloria are feeding Peter stew at the dinner table, and Peter asks Gloria what this is, and she says it's stew, and you know it's this beautiful moment where Gloria sees all of the comfort that Peter has been missing in his life and her heart sort of breaks open to him and she's ready to you know experience the potential hurt of loving somebody again right and um, it was so amazing to hear from Kate that that was her favorite moment because it was one of the moments that when I first met Julia I sort of said to her you know there were two moments in the book that brought great lump of tears to my throat and that was one of them and it was one for Julia as well. So to sort of come full circle and have the author see it in the movie and, and feel the power of it was, you know, my not so humble brag. Right, with, with, <laughs> without being paid to say that. She actually yeah. did it spon spontaneously. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, and it's such a different creative process, I'm sure, for Kate to write a novel and then for you to take that story and, and grow it to be a feature-length film. So the creative process is always fascinating to me. And, and I want to ask Diane, like, do you have a set creative process when you are attempting to write a song? Or how do you do what you do? I mean, if I write a song for a movie, I, it, I either read a script or I see something. And it kind of like, it's a subconscious thing I take. I take something from it. It's it's a weird like I have a computer in my brain that does it. I'm not even conscious of it. And to me, the um, message of this movie was found. It doesn't feel good to be found. And as soon as I had that chorus and I had, you know, that that you know that lyric in there, it just it felt like it kind of encompassed what this movie was about. And you know, and the best songs stand within the movie. They work within the movie. Then they also stand outside of the movie and can mean whatever they want. You want them to mean. Yeah. So wonderful. basically, I just sat down and got inspired and, and wrote it. Oh, amazing, though, how you can, you've can you done it for so many different topics and angles and, and, and just inspirational points. It's, it's wonderful that, that you know how to draw out the emotion and the heart in any story that you come into to do. A, I, tr I try my best. I, I, think you, I think your best is pretty good. Just Thank, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, Julia, I, I want to go back to, to the book. Like, what were some of the themes of the book that you wanted to make sure we carried through into the film? Well, for me, um, really the biggest theme for me was, was hope and also empathy. Just even when I read the book, just the idea of you know growth mindset, we didn't use those words in those days, but the idea that if you believe anything is possible, then you can make it so. I believe in manifestation, I believe in the power of hope. Women is, we, we manifestation. Ooh, yes. I like that, I like that, it's a I new term. Women uh, manifestation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then also, uh, Wendy and I talked about this, just the power of empathy and the fact that the book and the book is really structured around the moment that Peter looks in the eyes of the elephant and realizes, I need to send the elephant home. It's not about me. And I just think that's just such a powerful message and even more resonant today. I love that, too. I love animals, and I love elephants. Right? They're, yeah. so they're, they're, they're the most beautiful, amazing, um, empathetic... We don't even deserve them. We do not deserve elephants. In fact, we don't really deserve this planet, but that's all other conversation. I, and I, and I'm, sure I agree with I'm sure there's another movie and song in there. Clap somewhere. if you agree. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I know. You're, you're very much a proponent of animal rights. Absolutely. So, I mean, Absolutely. What, a, what a lovely pairing for you to come to yeah. this project. The, what, what, what made me interesting, I'm interested, nothing makes me interesting. What made me, I saw the title, the, El, um, the Magician's Elephant. I'm like, oh, there's an elephant? I want to do it. Really? Well, and when we first visited um, Diane's studio, she was wearing elephant socks and an elephant sweatshirt. And you didn't wear them today, though, did you? No, no, no elephant la socks. Ladybugs today. Today's ladybug. That's yeah. okay. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Um, so, talking about what was important uh, emotionally coming out of the book and, and thematically, I'm going to switch now to visually, Wendy, what your goal was with this film. Because, obviously, we've talked about it. It's, it's beautiful and... and, and but there's a lot of intent behind that. So can you share us a little bit on the environment and the character design that you were hoping to bring forth for this film? 
the story really is sort of a timeless fable, right? And we wanted to sort of lean into the timeless quality. The book is set in Europe, and it's a more traditional sort of northern Europe, um, northern European city in the early 1900s. And we wanted to be really um, not a specific place, not a specific area, era. We were very careful to try and build a world that reflected the world we would have wanted to see at the time, right? So a lot of architectural um, diversity, a lot of population diversity. We were very conscious of um, trying to represent humanity in the film, right? That all, you know, in 1910, um, you know, Leo and Gloria probably wouldn't have been married anywhere. But we wanted our world and our population to feel like we had scooped, you know, a, a sub New York City subway car, and there are people of all different types, and we are all connected. And the story of, of Peter's journey is about connection, about finding relationship. And so we, were, we, we had that as a very strong sort of goal. Because of that, I, was, I really didn't want to set it in Northern Europe. I, I really thought about Southern Spain and Portugal and Northern Africa and historical trade route um, kind of locations that had, you know, have had generations and generations of um, architectural styles and, and um, different cultures um, traveling through. So we, we made our own place that was inspired by some of those um, different architectural styles. And then we tried to give everything a timeless quality by sort of mixing some contemporary in with some period. So it didn't really feel like a period film. We, we tried to find ways in costuming and so on that let you know a mix of styles fit in there. But the town itself and the world are also really characters in the film. So the clouds really represent initially the loss of hope and the loss of you know any kind of belief in people forgetting to look up, people forgetting that they can make things happen. And so we, I was, I love clouds. I think clouds are one of the most amazing things that we get to look at on any given day. And they always remind me that no matter where I am in the world, there's someone else on the other side of the world that's also looking at clouds. No matter how different where I am sitting is from where they're sitting, we're all essentially under the one sky. And um, so whenever I travel, I take photos of clouds more than anything else, which is kind of odd and I some of them look like elephants. That, but <laughs> clouds look like uh, animals sometimes too. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. Um, so I had when I met Julia, I had just come back from Ireland, and I had been, you know, almost exclusively taking pictures of clouds, and. Um, so it, it felt really like, okay, I, you know, and I, there's a particular cloud type that I was really inspired by, which I have never seen in real life, but they're called mamatus clouds and they're bulbous and um, just surreal. And you look at pictures of them and think these can't possibly be real, but they are. And of course we were, you know, stylizing our world. So we stylized it based on the inspiration of this cloud type. We call our clouds boba clouds because they look like tapioca balls in bubble tea. Um, but we used them very specifically as a kind of, you know, they don't move, they don't break, they don't budge, they're oppressive and yet surreal, right? So there's a strange beauty to them that if you, because we, we needed the world to also feel appealing. It couldn't be kind of like, oh, everybody's under clouds and it's drab and dreary. You want to make a film that people can appreciate visually. Um, our production designer, Max Boas, and our art director, Yuri Loy, did an amazing job of kind of tracking the lighting color that, uh, that sort of allows us to see that the clouds are capturing the sun from above and they're you know, diffusing out this soft, beautiful, magical light, like the midnight sun in Iceland or something that's wrapping around you. And that as hope is returning, the clouds become more rosy and there's sort of a, a temperature change that, that you get throughout the film that helps you feel like hope is returning. That's beautiful. 
And, and I'm wondering, you, you, you paint the world, obviously, with visuals, and, and Diane, you, you paint with sound and, and, and words, and do you and find that you're affected by seeing the visuals on a film, or are you taking it again? I know you start with a script or something like that, but... I mean, I saw that? a rough cut in the movie. Um, that's how I got... The first thing I saw, I mean, I just... It's not... It's, it's what I feel more than what I see. Yeah. And, and found, again, like being such a powerful song... Thank you. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. The thing that I, I love, and thank you all for staying to watch the credits and for this Q&A, especially on such a beautiful sunny yeah. day, but you know, there's so many people yes. that put so much energy yes. and craft and talent yes. and artistry into and making and, bl- and blood and sweat well, and love. I, you know? they, and you want to see the credits, but I, but I just want to put a point on what you're saying, Diane, in terms of end title songs, right? That, I mean, the, like this song found for us just embodied the the resolution of these characters that all found their family, their found family, not their necessarily birth family, and that they felt found. And it just, it was, it just, it's such a beautiful song because it gives such a emotional kind of, it's uplifting, but it's also just resolution and transformation. So I just want to thank you. You know, we wanted people to feel the hope and joy that, that Peter and his found family had at the end of the film. And the, the song really does that for me. Thank you. Yes, yes that's awesome. a beautiful way to, to bring it all together. And, and I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so I, would just, I want to ask if anyone in the audience has a question that, that they would like to ask. I see in the back row. Can you uh, let us know? Can you explain animal logic? I know that Disney used to have a department where they studied animal behaviors. So can you explain in this film the credit animal logic? Animal Logic, as in the production company that did our work. Oh, I thought it was actually. I could, I could see where that gets confusing. <laughs> I, you know yes. what? I totally. Can you explain? Right? Can, you're saying can that? I say what? Can you explain human logic? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you cannot. <laughs> can you? <laughs> A- Animal Logic is the name of the um, visual effects and animation company that did that's the work. That, that's okay. I, but we I did love that. We're going to use it. that now. <laughs> we had a we lot of Animal Logic experts. We did actually have uh, an animal logician because we had Dr. Joshua Plotnick, um, who was our elephant um, consultant. And, and if he there was were credits, amazing. you could see it on TV. You could see all that. <laughs> you guys are going to go back and watch the credits now, so you get all this again, I know. But Sorry, Wendy. Yeah, I, go I, ahead. I want to make. I know I want other people to ask questions, but I just a comment on when you talk about the diversity and the inclusion in the film. I mean, something that I think Animal Logic gets credit for, and, and the and the filmmakers, uh, and and you guys know this because you guys understand animation. Often crowds in animated movies, right? They just paint. It's like the same model, and you just paint different colors, and they're called ethnically ambiguous. You know, sort of like make your crowds ethnically ambiguous, so people will project themselves onto the crowd. But it was an, an absolute essential for us in making this movie to build a crowd that of people of different sizes, shapes, background, and I think that's part of what you're seeing. Um, yeah, and I and hopefully more animated movies will put a priority, and I think Netflix was great because they gave us the budget and the resources and they understood the importance. So. Great. Are there any other questions from the audience? I know we have like a couple minutes left, but okay, here's one more question, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, being distinguished in your careers, is there any advice or words of wisdom you can give somebody who's just starting out in their career? I will start by saying be tenacious, persevere, and use this movie as an example. I mean, just, I developed it in 2008 and it got made during a pandemic, you know, over a decade later. So just never give up on your dream. Never, ever give up. I, I, I would actually, <laughs> I actually sort of think as well, you know, I often think of the, in my career, um, I, I think of, it's easier to ask um, forgiveness than get permission. And I yes, think I, yes, yes. I grew up to be a good girl rule follower. And I think sometimes I could have been pushier. I don't think I can be pushier. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, do you want to add any other thoughts to this? Um, just work fucking hard. And don't give up and don't listen to the assholes that tell you you can't do it. If you're going to do it, just do it. And don't let anything stand in your way. Simple as that. And what everybody said. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think Peter in this film, like his grit and everything, is yeah. is is embodying what you're expressing here. So I think it's it's lovely that. And in it doesn't true life, always have to. Ha- it doesn't always happen right away. That's the other thing. Like sometimes it's patience, and you just you just have to persevere. It's hard to be patient. I. I know. Maybe I shouldn't say patient. Just yeah. fucking patience is the destroy. hardest. Destroy. <laughs> I hate being patient. Well, I hate oh, it. We're recording, and I swore. Sorry. We can bleep those out. I think that's a thing. So again, technology. I, I think a couple. Yeah, there's a couple of moments there, but that's okay. So as we wrap up, is there any last thoughts that you want to make sure the audience hears from your experience working want, on this project? There was one other quick question. Oh, you want to do one more question? Okay, go ahead. I can't help but notice you're all women. I'm wondering, in business and creativity, what was different that you brought to it than what the men would have done with this film? That's a big question. Wow. I'll take a stab at that. Um, There's a thousand ways to tell any story, so a thousand different director and producer partnerships would have made, you know, a thousand times a thousand different films. So I think it's always a unique combination. Um, Specifically what I think female leadership through this film production brought, you know, we we were sent home to work through COVID when our first sequence was in editorial and we worked from home until um, March of last year. So we were working from home for over two years of our production. And I think that there was a very concerted effort from Julia and myself to be strong, empathic leaders of our team who were all struggling through COVID. And I personally feel incredibly grateful to Julia for her leadership in that and for her heart in that and for you know giving all of us permission to be vulnerable through that process and allowing our team to really bond um, and making the time for us to do that because I think that you know sometimes I think naturally as women we are a little bit more empathic to that sort of group feeling perhaps or maybe we just more readily open to our own emotions and so can imagine that other people are. That is so nice, Wendy Rogers. Thank you so much. At, back at you, same way. Uh, a lot of people wanted, a lot of men and women wanted to join our film because Wendy was a woman director um, and, they wanted, and they wanted to support that. But I think it's also for all of us, modeling for other women. Uh, that Just, you can do that it. You can be a leader. And now this is going to, yeah, I'm going to get into trouble for saying this because guys cry too. But we would cry and we weren't ashamed of it. And we weren't afraid to be vulnerable. Yeah, and I think that that's a good thing. The art department early on were like, oh, if you can make her cry, then the piece will be approved. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like that with songs too. The best songs make people cry. Yeah, I was going to say, Diane, you If probably- you cry, you buy. Oh, that's, well, that's, old a good, that's a good phrase. But, but for sure, I think, I think part, of, part of being women and having that openness and vulnerability, not to stereotype, but just as, as a general way of being, probably brought a lot of softness and richness to the story that you shared. So on, on, a, on, a, on a level of a song and the visual and thematic stuff. So I think it's a beautiful offering that you've brought to this, just being who you are, all of you. Um, oh, no, I, no, I do see one more we're, question. We're, I'll, I'll we're let powerful and mean reference. as well, I just yeah. want to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've been waiting a long time to see Wendy's name with director next to Yay. it. Thank Yay. you. Yay. <laughs> What's in development for you and what's coming next and for all of you? That's a great last question for everybody to share. What, what's coming up next? So um, JP and I are developing a project together at Netflix, and I'm also... Are you going to hire me again? <laughs> well, you, I, took, I took your number. <laughs> Maybe it's kidding? a musical. We, we, um, we would like just work with you for the rest of our lives. Yes. You're, you're amazing. Yeah. I mean, oh, come on. Thank you. Yeah. Really. Thank you. So are you. Thank you. And I'm also de- um, developing a project with uh, some European producers, Wonderful. both animated. Wonderful. And, and Diane, how many thousands of songs do you have rolling in your head right now? Oh, I got, I got lots. I'm working with all kinds of different artists from, you know, Becky G to Tiwa Savage to David Guetta. Um, I just did the movie 80 for Brady mm-hmm. that um, 
Well, Dolly Parton, Cindy Lauper, Debbie Harry, Gloria Estefan, and Belinda Carlisle on one song. Going to be you. That, that is so that's, that's really exciting. So like, much talent all squeezed into one. It's amazing. Five epic divas on yeah. one song. And, and, and one who wrote it. So, I mean, come on. I'm not quite the diva they are. I'm not a diva. They're all divas. Well, we're so thrilled that you guys shared with us today your experience in this film. And obviously, we're all fans looking forward to your next work. So oh, thank you. Oh, I thought you were talking about that. All of you. Oh, okay. All three of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, all of us. I, I didn't know if you were looking at me. No, <laughs> all three of you. I mean, yes, you especially them. brought so much great, great work into the world, and we look forward to more of it to come from all of you, whether it's together or separate, either way. Or both. So uh, even, even better if it's together again. But um, I just want to say thank you to you for being here today for some question and answer time. Thank you to all of you for coming. Thank, thank you for you. Netflix thank you so for hosting. Much. And we'll wrap up and say have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.